Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this programme, Allergic Disease on the Increase, coming to you on the Rural Health Channel. I'd like to acknowledge that this programme has been broadcast in the land of the Gurungai people of the Gadigal clan, part of the Aora Nation, traditional custodians of the land, and we acknowledge their elders past and present. Tonight, our panel will focus on allergic disease and the impact on all of us as the incidence and indeed prevalence increases. Join us in our discussion and send us your comments and questions via email, text, phone or even Twitter. The details are on your screen now. You can email your questions to questions at rhef.com.au. You can call us on 1800 646 You can text us on 0408 408 932. Or you can tweet us on at Rural Health Ed. Now let's meet our panel. Dr. Kim, Kim Faulkner Hogg is a dietitian based at the Allergy Unit at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney <coughs> and is the coordinator of the New South Wales branch of the Food Allergy and Intolerance, Intolerance I should say, Interest Group for Dietitians. Welcome, Kim. Welcome, if, only, if only it were tolerance. <laughs> Alison Kakakios is a paediatric allergist and the head of the a Department of Allergy and Immunology at the Children's Hospital Westmead. Welcome, Alison. Thanks, Norman. Rob Lobley is the director of the allergy unit at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and has been extensively involved in guideline development and legislation and educational program development in the area of allergies and anaphylaxis. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, Norman. Maria Said is a registered nurse with experience in emergency and paediatric nursing and is an advocate for individuals who live with the risk of anaphylaxis. Welcome, Maria. Thanks. And Darren Thompson is a nursing lecturer at the University of South Australia especially concerned with allergies and eczema, and is involved with the Professional Certificate of Allergy Nursing. Welcome, Darren. Thank you, Norman. What is the Professional Certificate in Allergy Nursing? Well, it's a 16-week online uh, postgraduate prof professional certificate that we, uh, University of South Australia, has uh, for nurses, uh, and um, that is it's, it's delivered all online, um, other than the clinical component that they do at the end of the course. It composes of 13 uh, topics covering a wide range of manifestations of allergic disease. So they um, have a much greater understanding of the manifestations of allergy, the impact it has on people, and of course the evidence-based um, education that's behind it and where the resources are. And, and does it turn you into a nurse practitioner? No, it doesn't turn you into a nurse practitioner, but it does give you a, a postgraduate uh, certificate qualification which uh, can direct some nurses uh, into their jobs within certain allergy departments that can, can help uh, their job pathway that way. But it could also, certainly it's open to the um, rural and uh, community nurses where they are involved with seeing many of these people okay. that have Ad got allergic disease. Advertisement over. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Maria, what's your story? Why did you get involved? I uh, am a registered nurse and um, when I had my second child, uh, I realised just how little I knew about allergy. Uh, at age 12 months, I gave my son a peanut butter sandwich back in the 1990s. Um, he had a memorable sandwich. <laughs> yeah, it is quite mem quite a memorable sandwich. Uh, it took three years for him to be properly diagnosed. What happened when you gave him the peanut butter sandwich? Um, he had uh, the first time he had um, erythema and um, so some redness of the skin. Some redness of the skin and some um, urticaria, some hives. Um, I. I rang my GP and my GP said to give him some antihistamine. Um, I asked him what else and he said just don't give him peanuts. So uh, we, we kept <laughs> peanuts in the house and a month later he picked up some toast off the table that my husband had left on the table and um, he put it to his mouth and with that reaction he was screaming, he had some swelling. I rang my GP again and he said well gosh Maria we went through this a month ago just give him some antihistamine. Um, he had a, a reaction... Which, of course, makes almost no difference. Well, no, but at least I felt, I guess, that I was doing something and that I'd rung my GP. I felt confident that I was doing all that I could. Um, at age two, uh, he touched whole peanuts, shelling them for his grandmother. And um, with that, he rubbed his eyes and he started swelling. He didn't go into anaphylaxis, but he certainly had an allergic reaction. And then at age three, he had a, a major reaction to um, what we think is contaminated chocolate. And with that, he, um, he had some urticaria. Um, he had some uh, difficulty breathing, so he was diagnosed with asthma by this point. 
And, um, so he'd already developed asthma? He'd already developed asthma. He'd been on an antihistamine every day since he was about two. And he was on his asthma medication daily. He'd been in, in and out of hospital numerous times. They'd served him peanut butter in the hospital setting. Um, it was pretty scary stuff. So then when he um, had his anaphylaxis at age three and a half, um, I took him to my local hospital. Uh, I didn't, uh, um, he had just been diagnosed, but even I hadn't been educated properly. And I was told about facial swelling, but nobody mentioned genital swelling. Um, so I took him to um, my GP and my GP said, no, it's just a rash after a virus, just keep treating his asthma. Uh, but then I noticed the um, genital angioedema took him to the hospital and I was questioned for three hours about sexual abuse. Okay. Uh, no, and it was staff that I knew. They wanted, they asked me if I wanted to be transferred to another hospital because I knew so many people there. Um, they drew pictures of him. They questioned myself and my husband separately. And um, in the end, I basically said, I want to speak to a paediatrician. I'm not talking to anybody else. And my paediatrician then said, this child is having an anaphylaxis. You've been treating each of his symptoms separately. Um, and then he was diagnosed and then he was transferred to Westmead Hospital. And what's he like now? He's a strapping 22-year-old ratbag kid. He's a policeman, so... <laughs> Um, but doesn't dare eat a peanut. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. So you know, criminals threaten him with a bag of peanuts oh. rather than a gun. Well, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Um, but it's. I think it's quite ironic that he, you know, has his, his gun and his handcuffs and his taser and, and his auto all of that. And he has two adrenaline auto injectors on his ankle, around his ankle, um, all the time. So he had a challenge two years ago because he hadn't had a reaction for 17 years, and um, I think that was a good experience for him. Uh, he learnt that a tiny amount of peanut can certainly um, so just reminded. trigger a big reaction. And that adrenaline works as well. So I think it was good for two reasons. Typical story, Darren? Yes. Quite often in uh, clinical practice we see the, that type of story come with people, um, with parents. And sometimes parents are frustrated because they have said to practitioners these things are happening and they, like Maria, even today, th those stories are still coming by that the doctor has indicated that it may be something else. And you've got some stories of people you come across and you've got some pictures of them here, typical stories. Tell us about this woman. Um, this woman here had uh, went to actually a wedding reception. She told them that she was allergic to walnuts. She disclosed that she was the person with the allergy at the wedding reception, um, yet she was fed a dessert that had walnuts in the crust of a particular cake. She was five months pregnant and she hesitated in administering the adrenaline auto injector. Um, she was rushed to hospital and even staff at the hospital hesitated to administer adrenaline. Um, they actually gave her nebulised adrenaline. Uh, she later uh, we advised her then to go and see an allergy specialist and allergists that I've spoken to since that time have said that you would administer adrenaline to a pregnant person if they were showing uh, intramuscularly, if they were showing the signs of anaphylaxis. And the story of this young man? This young man went to a, um, a charity function and um, as he had his meal put in front of him, he saw that it had grated cheese on it and he asked, so told, he was milk them, allergic. Told, told them that he was milk allergic and that he couldn't have any cheese on his food and no milk in his, in his meal. Um, the meal was allegedly taken away, um, turned onto another plate and brought back to him. After two mouthfuls, he went into anaphylaxis and needed three doses of adrenaline to, um, yep, to come good. Kim, you must hear stories like that all the time, people just believing that they're pulling your leg or they're neurotic or hysterical and they don't really have an allergy. Yes, we do. It's one of the things that patients will talk about all of the time. And it even goes as far uh, as grandparents and extended family is convincing them that this is actually real and that a little bit isn't okay. And a lot of uh, situations where you are in restaurants, that's the biggest thing to get across to staff that it has to be totally avoided. So how do you educate families about this? So that they actually know that it's serious? Because you can hardly say, well, look, just watch. 
you know. No, you, you, um, certainly if they've experienced it with their child, that's One's all the experience that they, that they need. But it is very difficult to educate for eating out because you can never really control for what is going on in the back room and there is a certain level of trust. Certainly when the children are very little, we get them to take food with them to a restaurant because a lot of restaurants at that age will accept it. It's when you get to the adult age, they're starting to say that's, that's not acceptable and these people have done all of the correct things in identifying themselves, telling people about it beforehand and therefore thinking that it is all organised. Now this program isn't just about allergy, you know, food allergy, it's about allergy in the broad. Rob Lobley, what, when, when somebody says to you, well, what is an allergy? It sounds like an obvious question, you know, I come out in a rash, are we um, I get hives, but what is it actually? Well, uh, an allergy is essentially an exaggerated immune response of the IgE type. So it's an antibody? It's an antibody, uh, and it's uh, specialised uh, to provide protection against parasites, but in some people, atopic people, there's a genetic tendency to ex produce exaggerated amounts of IgE antibody against al allergens in the environment which are normally harmless. Um, and so when a person is exposed, they've got high Ig antibody levels and they react, then they'll exhibit the immediate signs and symptoms of a, an allergic reaction by uh, occurring through the release of histamine and other inflammatory mediators from the mast cells that bind the Ig antibody. Things that make you sneeze. So, I mean, I used to think of atopia as just asthma, hay fever and eczema, but you're, you're using it in the context that it's one of these typical allergic responses, whether it's from food or pollen or house dust mite or whatever it is that causes one of these problems. Well, as well long as it's through the itself, by definition, is the genetic tendency to produce these exaggerated responses. The allergic diseases are the ones that uh, occur in people who are atopic depending on what they're exposed to and depending on a range of other factors, and uh, genetic and otherwise. So Alison, just make sense of this for you. You, you. you hear about contact allergies from nickel or cosmetics or you hear about um, uh, the atopic you know, asthma, hay fever and so on. Mm. You hear about food allergies, mm. um, drug allergies like penicillin and so on. Mm. Just make sense of all this for us before we move on. Okay, so um, atopy, as Rob said, um, was actually a term coined almost a century ago to describe this inherited tendency on part of particular families to develop these allergic diseases like hay fever and asthma. Long before the new of antibodies. Long before the IgE was discovered, which was actually in about 1963. So we then sort of found out that actually it was the IgE that was associated with what we mostly think of as allergic reactions, which is the immediate sort that come on and cause your, the hives and the redness that Maria was describing and can, when they're very serious can cause respiratory difficulties and collapse and death and that's what's known as anaphylaxis. Now that's the, the sort of IgE mediated type of allergy, but you mentioned the contact type which is actually a completely different type and is not going to cause you to have such a, an acute severe reaction. Um, it, it, it's a delayed type reaction and it's particularly apparent with things like nickel and plants and various other um, sort of contact uh, perfumes. Some people are allergic to the things in perfumes. That's a contact dermatitis. It's not the same as the sort that's associated with the allergic diseases. And what about drug reactions? Drug reactions are actually um, span the whole range of these allergic diseases from the, very, from the sort we all know about which is the penicillin reaction, the IgE mediated penicillin reaction which can cause anaphylaxis when you inject or, or take penicillin by mouth when in someone who's penicillin allergic um, to over to um, very serious drug reactions which are delayed which, can some, which often occur or associated with um, like anticonvulsant medications, uh, the barbiturates, also with sulfonamide medications, and they can cause reactions as severe as what's called toxic epidermal necrolysis, which is as if the whole body's been burnt shreds and shreds off the skin. And talk to me about the what they call the atopic march. Right, the atopic march was a, a term that was coined to describe what we understand about the progression of allergic diseases. 
so that in infants and young children... We've got a graphic on that, which we might yeah, show, yeah. Um, ...would be helpful. So in infants and young children, you can see that food allergy and atopic eczema, which can be associated with that food allergy, are, much, uh, are, are the most common forms of allergic diseases, but they tend to go off as the child ages. When, however, as, they, as those are actually receding, what's starting to develop in the child is the allergy to, or atopy to the inhalant allergens, like house dust mite and grass pollens and cat and dog allergens. Um, and then we start to get the allergic rhinitis or hay fever, which is associated with those things, and asthma. And so they start becoming much more prominent as the person ages and as they become young adults, it's actually asthma and allergic rhinitis that are the most common so, atopic diseases. To what extent is that a causative pathway that you get food allergies and that triggers the rest no, or it's it, just what happens yeah. in the course of things? It's, look, there's a lot of controversy about this and I don't think that the jury's in. Um, because you don't have to have food allergy. In fact, no, you, you do not have to have food allergy. In fact, probably most people who have inhalant um, you know, allergen sensitivity and, and asthma and rhinitis ha have and not eczema. actually had, uh, and eczema, have not actually had food allergy. In fact, we know that from studies done on people with atopic eczema that about 30% of them have associated food allergies and that percentage actually de diminishes quite significantly, as in the atopic march, as they become older. So that adults with atopic dermatitis are much more likely to be sensitised to house dust mite or some of the other inhalant allergens rather than the food allergens. Yeah, the world thinks it's food. That's right, yeah, and that, and that is not, that, that's an, an incorrect um, assumption that it's all related to food, it's, it's not. So Darren, what are the common foods that give trouble with food allergy when you're going to get it? Uh, the common ones for the very young children are milk, uh, cow's milk, uh, egg, um, uh, peanut, um, and uh, in, in Australia sesame seed uh, is, is um, there as well. And, and Kim, which are the hardest ones to deal with? I mean, are they, are they very different? Because peanuts are supposed to last a long time and yes. seems to be the most vicious of them. But It depends, I guess, on what we're looking at within the diet. If we're looking at just strictly replacing the nutrition that one particular allergen has, the nut itself, if you just took it out from the total nutrition part of the diet, it doesn't make a big impact. If you take egg out just from a nutritional perspective, there's a lot of other things that supply protein. However, egg is used in a lot of foods and in a lot of snack foods and in a lot of food preparation. So avoiding it does change the diet actually quite a lot and can decrease the calories, so you have to be careful. Milk, I think, probably makes the biggest impact nutritionally because milk will provide protein as well as calcium, as well as some fat, as well as vitamin A as well as vitamin D. So if we can't have milk, we have to be able to replace all of those food groups, not just simply the calcium side. So it requires some planning, and we'll come back to diagnosis in a minute. So Rob, why is it increasing? I mean, we hear about the hygiene the hypothesis that we're living in this clean world, and the immune system is not being trained properly in the first year of life. How true is that? That's been controversial as well. Well, there's a lot of uh, supportive evidence for what's been called the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, the idea there is that normally in early childhood, the immune system learns to react to a whole lot of uh, microorganisms in the environment and, uh, and develops immunity. But the theory goes that in the last 20, 30 years or so, kids are growing up in a more hygienic environment, not exposed to all the same microbes. And so the immune system, wanting to be busy all the time, turns it, its attention to otherwise harmless antigens. And there's quite a lot of evidence to support it. It's clearly not the whole story. Um, and it certainly doesn't account for most of the changes in food allergy that we've seen in the last 15, 20 years, particularly the nut allergies. But well, they've been caused by pediatricians, haven't they? I was yeah. by, t by telling parents not to feed their children these substances and to keep weaning till later. I mean, Israeli kids yeah. have less food allergy, peanut allergy, anyway, peanut allergy yeah. than the same kids in Britain. I mean, yes. and it's because they, they are exposed to peanuts early. Yes. Well, you're quite right, Norman, there, that, that we've actually done a complete 180 in terms of our, our recommendations uh, about um, infant feeding, if you like. Um, 
over the past couple of decades, um, as food allergy has doubled or even tripled in some um, instances, we've been telling parents um, of, of high risk atopic children, that is people who have a risk of atopy in their family, um, to avoid certain highly allergenic foods such as peanut and the other nuts, cow's milk and egg until they're a certain age. Now that hasn't worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the interesting study that you brought up was the, the study that was done on children of an ethnic, ethnically um, similar background, um, which was Jewish kids, um, so half of whom lived in Israel and half of whom lived in the United Kingdom. And in those particular places, the advice given at the time was to avoid peanut until the age of three years in the UK. And this is in the same population of children. And in Israel, they're introduced to peanut from the age of four months in a snack called bamba, which is, a, which is highly enriched with peanut it's allergen. Halva, yeah. yeah, and they basically, um, the, the Israeli kids had virtually no peanut allergy whereas the rate of peanut allergy in the UK as, were, as people were religiously following the guidelines about not introducing peanut to their children was doubling over the same time. So the recommendations changed? Because the I, NHMRC has moved a little bit earlier in terms of solids, but not quite as early as the allergists would like. No, that's right. Uh, so what you're referring to is the infant feeding guidelines um, which have been recently brought out by the NH and MRC, which continues to recommend um, exclusive breastfeeding until the age of six months, actually. Um, with, whereas the ASCIA guidelines for infant feeding... ASCIA. Uh, ASCIA is the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy, and it's the peak body which uh, looks at... Uh, which um, oversees the management of allergic diseases and to which uh, most of us here belong. Um, We've brought out uh, infant feeding guidelines which actually say um, that um, parents can now introduce uh, foods to solid foods to their um, infants from the age of four months or probably between the ages of four months and six months if they're ready to have them. We're not saying that you've got to force these sure. foods into them. If they're ready to have them in a form that they can have them and no food is excluded. So Kim, what do you do when, you know, if this is the recommendation and you've got a mother, because we're now getting to that sort of age where mothers have gone through this mistaken period where you, know, you were exposed to these, these foods later, a higher rate of food allergy, they're coming through to childbirth with a peanut allergy, and the right thing to do for their kid is probably to flood them with peanut early on in life, but the mother's going to be at risk. What do you do? We often will sit down with the parents because there are uh, mixed messages that do come through and some of the parents like to um, follow one particular strain of advice and others will go with another strain of advice. So we do talk about what the risks are and that we are still waiting for more research to come out um, in this particular area. I don't think around the world yet they've actually made a 100% decision that this is what we all need to do, but that is the trend at the moment and that's where the guidelines have moved forward to it. So we are saying to mums at this point in time that they shouldn't be avoiding any of the allergens but in their own But they might be avoiding diets. it to protect themselves. If they're avoiding it to protect themselves, then it's going to be out of their diet. They're, they can't... So you just have to live with it. If the they are, are pregnant and they have to avoid it, then if they eat it, yep. you know, end case scenario. So in that particular child, they're not going to be exposed, at least through what the mother is having. And I'm almost, fri almost frightened to ask this question, Rob. What about the gluten story? Because you do get kids and adults who are wheat allergic, and it's not all celiac disease. No, that's true. I don't want to spend the rest of the program on this, but I just wanted to no, touch no, on no, it. No, that's true. Celiac disease is a, is a, a T-cell-mediated uh, immune response against gluten and the damage occurs in the small bowel. So there's an enteropathy. Um, uh, it's quite different from the type one or immediate uh, IgE mediated allergies to wheat, wheat that do occur. Uh, they can occur in young children, but there's some interesting um, uh, And we haven't talked syndrome. about the symptoms here of food allergies, because right. we're yeah. talking about what, abdominal pain, vomiting, uh, no, no, we're talking about kids who are allergic to wheat who will develop urticaria, angioedema, 
anaphylaxis even from exposure to wheat. That's a true. But they wheat. can get exercise induced anaphylaxis yes, too. Yes, there is a syndrome called wheat dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis, which is a bizarre syndrome where the person can eat wheat safely if they don't exercise. They can exercise safely if they haven't eaten wheat. But if they eat wheat within about two to six hours before exercising, then they can have full-blown anaphylaxis. So it's a very, diff it's a very different condition different and you're syndrome, not to be yeah. confused with celiac disease. Let's go to... Oh, sorry, the other one, thing I want to talk about in terms of prevention was pets. Ah, yes. <laughs> because my understanding of the evidence is the more pets you have in the first year of life, mm. the better. Sound, uh, yes, there is some very good evidence actually, um, some of which has come out of New Zealand, I might say. Um, well, they've got nothing else to do there. <laughs> <laughs> Not so, it's sort of pets they have, but, but anyway, the, the evidence is that, that if, if uh, even in high risk atopic families, if they have a pet, particularly if they have a cat and a dog in the household, they're actually protected from the development of allergic diseases and from sensitisation. Um, to to other um, sort of allergens, uh, so it, it's just it, it's very difficult to understand this, but it presumably relates to the idea of introducing people to large amounts of an allergen at an early age, thereby inducing tolerance rather than allergy. Uh, yeah. And talking about tolerance, that's you're you're testing tolerance in terms of milk because cooked milk mm -hmm. is thought to be able to. Yep treat perhaps milk allergy? Yes. Well, not to be tried is, at home by yourself? Yeah, no, definitely not. This, 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 these, are, these are aspects of food allergy that are under a lot of um, study at present as we speak all around the world, including in Sydney. Um, and what, what we've, um, we're looking at is the fact that we know that certain people who are allergic to um, raw milk or I won't say raw egg, but I'll say lightly cooked egg, who have, you know, can even have full-blown anaphylaxis to those foods, can safely tolerate well-cooked baked milk or baked egg. Um, so the protein's been denatured? The protein has somehow been altered. Um, and, it, it, I mean, denatured is one of the words to use it, but there are many proteins in both cow's milk and, and egg, and some of which are definitely altered by cooking. So we're actually actively studying um, uh, the, the how long this tolerance or the, we call it desensitisation at the present because we don't so think we've demonstrated tolerance. Um, explain this graphic to us, Rob, because this is not, this is not with treatment, but this is the, the, if you like, the natural course of egg allergy in, in most people. Yeah, well, well, years ago, 20 years ago, we used to tell people that almost all kids grow out of their egg allergy by the time they get, get to school age, and, and this is no longer true uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear. But certainly before they go to university. Mostly, yes. I, I think that's showing the decline in, in prevalence of, uh, of egg allergy with increasing age, and almost everybody grows out of their egg allergy by the time they get to adult life. Let's go to our first case study. Jack is aged 26 months and is brought to Alice's practice by his mother, who's anxious about the future. Jack was recently rushed to hospital after eating a small piece of a muesli bar which contained peanuts and other tree nuts. He broke out in hives and had swelling around the eyes, and his mother took him straight to the local hospital, at which point he began wheezing. He was treated with adrenaline and sent home with an auto-injector, an, an adrenaline auto-injector. Jack also had, has had eczema, which started when he was about four months old. So what are you going to do about young Jack? Well, um, this, this is such a common scenario, really, and we see this every day. In fact, I was on call at the Children's Hospital at Westmead Emergency Department over the weekend, and I had two calls about children coming in with anaphylaxis. So, first of all, we've got to diagnose what caused the anaphylaxis. Jack, it's clearly t related in time-wise to the muesli bar, which contained peanuts rather than so I'm suspecting peanut or one of the tree nuts has caused this problem. Just remind us what the tree nuts are. Okay, they're cashew, pistachio, almond, hazelnut, walnut, pecan, Brazil nut, and various other nuts, but th those are the main ones. And particularly cashew and pistachio allergy goes along with cashew allergy. So we've seen a really big rise in the in amount of cashew allergy, actually. So what's happened is, is, is perfect, is good. 
Jack has been managed very well for his episode of anaphylaxis and the reason I'm calling it anaphylaxis, which is the most severe form of acute allergic reaction, is that he wheezed, which indicates a respiratory distress. He was given an adrenaline injection. Um, in this case, he was treated with an EpiPen, which is one of the types of adrenaline auto-injectors, which was perfectly correct treatment and he was observed and then he was allowed to go home. Now, we don't investigate immediately um, for, we don't immediately do skin prick tests when he's there in the emergency department because we think that it's best to wait for two to four weeks after the actual acute episode um, to be sure of the, um, the, you know, the fact that he hasn't sort of <laughs> released all of his mm -hmm. IgE so that we can actually check that, the, that, that it was actually peanut and, um, or, or one of the tree nuts. So we would bring him back to our um, uh, allergy clinic and we would then do some skin prick testing. Um, we could do blood testing, but it's best, I think, in this case, because we don't know exactly what the, the nut was to do the range of skin prick but testing. But some kids will react. So are we talking about patch testing or prick no, testing? No, no, we're talking about prick testing, which is we get standardised allergens peanut and the other tree nuts and we put a drop on their skin um, usually the forearm is used but in young children we can use other areas and then we um, touch it into the skin in a standardized way with a little metal lancet and then we wait for 15 minutes and we see whether a red mark or a, a, a lump a red itchy lump develops a bit what would have happened if he'd gotten hives um, and if, if that does develop, then we know that he's got specific IgE, the allergy antibody, to that particular allergen that we've used. Why don't you just measure the IgE? Uh, well, we could, um, but it's not so good when we're checking out a range of foods. Um, because specific IgE... But some of these kids will react all over the place, won't they, when you put on the spoon print? Not really. Um, you're right, some do, especially if they have severe eczema, and that might be one reason why we don't do skin prick testing. We would probably prefer to do some blood testing. Um, but in his case, it's relatively specific, I think. So I think if we, if we actually, and the skin prick tests are good, they're well standardised for the peanut and for the tree nut. So I think that will be all right, yeah. So what if you're coming at it the other way, Rob? The, a kid or an adult think, thinks that they're food allergic. Um, you know, they've got odd symptoms, but they never had anaphylaxis, and then you do the tests on them. How do you make your way through that? Because just having the test doesn't necessarily say you've got the allergy, does it? No, that's exactly right. Because the, it's the yes. exact flip, side, flip of what yep. Alison's doing yep. with this young child. Yeah, both the skin prick test and the blood test, the, the RAS blood test, measure specific IgE against particular allergens, uh, either in the, in the tissues or in the blood. Um, they only detect IgE antibodies. They do not diagnose disease. And so the, the challenge then is to try and work out uh, how to interpret each particular test. Uh, size matters, so the bigger the skin test and the higher the teeter of the antibody in so the blood. So we've got blood, this graph here coming up. The more likely it is to be related to clinical symptoms, it, but it's a, a probability function. So that graph there shows on the vertical axis the probability of reacting in a challenge test against on the horizontal axis the size of a skin prick test. The bigger the test, the more likely they are to react. But it's still not one on one, still not 100%. Not 100% by any means. And, and we've also got the blood test here which shows the same thing. Shows the same thing. But it's important to emphasise that th these tests only predict the likelihood of reacting. They, they cannot tell you how severe a reaction might be. This is or, the IgE test with peanut. Yeah, that's the blood test. Or whether the person is, uh, is going to get anaphylaxis or not. The severity of the reaction depends on a whole range of other factors other, beyond just the level of the So IgE the danger antibody. is somebody could go and see somebody who's inexperienced, does all this test and said you're allergic. They can they change their diet and it's all unnecessary and particularly okay. with the profound effects that you talked about earlier. So you've got to be really careful. That, that, look, they do need to be careful and that's where the um, allergists know that some of these things need to be tested so they actually have to eat the food in order to determine whether or not they have got an allergy to it and whether or not that goes ahead is the judgement of the doctor. So Alison, he's come up with what, a peanut allergy, something like that? Okay, so let, let's say that he does come up on skin prick testing to, to peanut 
and to none of the other tree nuts, um, to, to none of the tree nuts. So we say, okay, he's had a definite anaphylaxis at the age of 26 months to peanut um, and that puts him in a higher risk category for having another reaction. Again, we can't tell whether it's going to be anaphylaxis or, or not, but it certainly puts him in a high risk category. So we would definitely have to educate him and his mother about, I mean, he's only 26 months, so it'll be mostly his family. Um, but if he goes to childcare, we'll have to educate them as well. We'll have to educate them about peanut in food and how he must be excluding it. Um, we have to educate um, his mother, his family and the childcare centre about... Um, so does it mean the childcare centre can't have peanut at all? In the no, room? it does not mean that. Um, I mean, many childcare centres actually these days elect to be without peanut and tree nuts because they're relatively easy to exclude, unlike cow's milk and egg, which are staple parts of the diet, which are virtually impossible to exclude. We don't, um, we don't insist that um, you know, uh, childcare centres are free of peanut. We know that that can actually lead to other problems, um, such as blame if, a, if another parent um, accidentally brings in something with peanut and a child has a reaction. So what we prefer to do is to educate and to say, right, Jack, He's coming to your childcare centre, he has a peanut allergy which puts him at risk of anaphylaxis. He must have his um, action plan. Um, so we would draw up this particular action plan and this is specific for the EpiPen. We have another action plan which is specific for a different type of adrenaline auto-injector. Um, this is to be filled out by the doctor who prescribes the EpiPen. Um, and it, it leaves room here for a photograph of Jack so that he's readily identifiable, his age, what he's allergic to, which will be peanut, and the doctor signs it down here. And over on this side, it runs through stepwise the uh, way of managing um, an, ep an allergic reaction from mild symptoms progressing down to the more, much more severe type, which is called anaphylaxis. And the management, particularly if he starts ha having any respiratory symptoms such as wheezing, has to be the injection of the adrenaline using the, the EpiPen in the manner that's been described and shown to um, his family and hopefully the childcare centre. The instructions are also down on the side there and also on the side of the EpiPen. But Rob, yep. GPs can't prescribe EpiPen. Uh, well, first, first of all, EpiPen is an over-the-counter medication. Anybody can buy it. You don't need a prescription. Um, but it is available on the PBS and it can be, so it, it can be subsidised and the PBS prescription can be uh, provided by a specialist in clinical immunology or allergy, paediatric allergist, uh, emergency physician and in country areas uh, GPs are able to prescribe under the PBS uh, of their own accord uh, if the child is admitted to a hospital. If the child presents to the surgery, uh, the GP can still prescribe under the PBS uh, by consultation with a specialist, and, and that can be done over the phone. If you need to ask a question or would like to call questions at rhef.com.au, that's the email address. You can call us on 1800 646015. You can text us on 0408 408 932, and you can tweet us on at Rural Health Ed. Maria, take us through how these auto-injectors work. There are actual training devices um, of both adrenaline auto-injectors, both the EpiPen and the Anapen. Um, we encourage people to practice with the adrenaline auto-injector training devices, no needle, no medication, regularly. Um, this, however, is a live device, uh, live EpiPen that has expired and I'm about to inject it into the orange and not the outer aspect of my thigh. Um, we ask people to put their fist around the EpiPen, um, to move their fingers and thumb away from both ends. Uh, the blue end is the safety end and the orange end is the needle end. Blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. Remove the safety release. You place it on the outer... Sorry, and don't imagine for a moment that injecting an orange is going to help the child with the anaphylactic reaction. <laughs> no, you would inject the child's thigh. It can be injected through clothing. 
uh, but you would frisk the child's leg to make sure they haven't got a matchbox okay, car so in Okay, so this orange is about to get the shock of its life. Yeah. Okay, so you place it on the outer aspect, midway between the knee and the hip. You place and you push. You hear the click. You hold it there for 10 seconds. Meanwhile, someone's calling an ambulance. And the 10 seconds are up, you remove it. As you go to remove the device, the orange end actually extends over the needle so you can't see the needle. We tell people to take that to the hospital um, once the ambulance arrives. Rub the site of the injection rub the, rub straight the orange after. The, tell me about the Anapen. Um, the Anapen uh, we've had in Australia for about three years. Um, again, you would put your fist around the device. It has a grey end and a black end. The black end is your needle shield. The grey end is your safety end. You remove the needle shield, you remove the safety cap, you place again on the thigh and you place your thumb over the red button and you hear a click, you hold it there for 10 seconds. Once the 10 seconds is up, you remove it and rub the, the thigh. And, and Rob, you know, you, you've got to be careful what you try, choose to use as a GP given what's co commonly available or understood in childcare centres or schools. Yes, uh, well that's true. Most of the schools have been trained initially in the use of the EpiPen. Um, because the Anapen works in a different way, it's easy to get confused about what to do in an emergency. People can panic. And I think it's safer to stick with the one device in, in the school setting. Once they leave school and they're out in the world, they can make their own choice about what they want to use. That's fine. But I did want to emphasise that there are two different doses available for both the EpiPen and the Anapen. The EpiPen and Anapen Junior, uh, 150 microgram, and the, sorry, the green one, and they're both colour coded in the same way. You just uh, happened to have forgotten the colour code for a yes. moment there. Uh, Sorry, I wasn't Dr. Lovely. The, yeah, the, 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 ye the yellow one is 300 microgram uh, in both devices, and uh, the transition in Australia is at 20 kilograms. So when a, a child reaches 20 kilograms, they're ready to switch over to the full dose. Although the product information in the package says 30 kilograms. So internationally, 30 kilograms is a switch over. In Australia, 20. And between 20 and 30, it probably doesn't matter all that much. And just very briefly, Maria, there's all sorts of nice ways to carry your EpiPen, just very briefly. Yeah, it's really important if you're prescribed an EpiPen or an Anapen, you must always have it with you. And in the case of children, in close proximity. So we have this little bum bag that mum can pass to teacher at school. Um, teenagers don't like the world knowing that they're carrying it, so this is a slimline belt that you can s put under their shirt. Um, this some is the one your son uses? This under is the one, yeah, support. my son use it, uses. He uh, puts it on his ankle and it actually contains, has space there for two, two devices around and, his ankle. And the other thing is also, because you, you might be lucky and never have to use it, but you might forget how to use it, so you need a refresher. Really important to practice regularly. So if you're going to see the GP, the GP should remind you. Let's move on to another case study. Wendy is aged 18 and she's actually quite obese, has recently moved to a rural town. She's come into your practice, Rob, after developing an allergic response to being stung by a bee in the backyard. She describes a very painful sensation, a local swelling, which was followed by the development of a red and itchy rash all over her body. What are you going to do for Wendy? Well, Based on the story, I'd be suspecting that she's, uh, she's allergic to the, uh, to the uh, sting. Um, and so I'd be skin testing her. I'd, I normally do both the blood and the skin tests uh, to get an idea of the, uh, of the antibody uh, specificities and level. Um, and then a discussion needs to be had about whether or not uh, to embark on immunotherapy. So uh, to prevent another reaction. To prevent anaphylaxis. So before you go on, is this somebody who needs an, an EpiPen or an, an auto-injector for an, an, the likelihood of another bee sting? That would be advisable, uh, particularly if they live in a remote area. Um, 
the, the difficulty is uh, if somebody hasn't had full-blown anaphylaxis, they've been stung, they might have had a large local reaction, maybe involving an arm or a leg or, or the face, you can't be sure that they really are at risk of anaphylaxis. Um, about a third of reactions the next time round are less severe, about a third the same and about a third more severe, and it's hard to pr predict. Sometimes the only way of knowing is to actually do a sting challenge and see what reaction they have. With a real bee? Yep, with a real bee. You're kidding. First really? catch your bee. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, if, if, if they're in a particularly high risk group, if they've got asthma, if they've got other allergies that might make them more prone to be more reactive at certain times of the season, um, so you've got if to have a they live in remote history. areas, you play it safe. If they work with bees, if they, you know, if they're bee lovers, and work with bees, then they should almost certainly be uh, undertaking immunotherapy. And it, it works very effectively. About 90% can be fully protected. Through immunotherapy? Through immunotherapy. Is that permanent? Is it, or is that it probably is permanent. Um, no, no, I mean, do you have to keep on having it to keep no. it down? Like, like the milk, if you're on this cooked milk treatment for milk no, allergy, the, that's probably got to be... The maintained. usual immunotherapy course goes from three to five years. Most people would probably err on the conservative side and say five years. But studies have shown that after five years, if you stop, almost everybody uh, fails to react to bee sting challenges. And can, you sense, can you can you tolerise to penicillin? You can acutely. Uh, so if somebody needs penicillin because they have a serious infection and that's the only drug available or the drug of choice, and they're known to be allergic to penicillin, they can undergo what's called rapid desensitisation. It can be done either orally or parenterally, uh, giving tiny doses increasing every 20 minutes or so under observation should be done in hospital under careful observation and within six or eight hours they can get up to the full dose and they'll tolerate that dose while they're having the drug but as soon as they stop within a few days the drug is gone off all the IgE receptors and they're then susceptible to anaphylaxis once again. So this is what you were talking about earlier, Alison. For mm. some allergens, you've got to keep on them. You do, and, and this is particularly important. I'll, I'll just give an example of a, a, say, a young child who has eczema, atopic eczema, and skin prick tests may be done. And unfortunately, in the context of atopic eczema, um, the skin prick tests are not really, that they have to be interpreted very carefully because many children will come up positive to certain foods, but they'll actually be already eating those foods. And sometimes people will take them off those foods, such as egg and cow's milk, in the hope that that will improve their eczema. The problem is that those children have been tolerant to those foods. So the risk is when they actually start having uh, ingest the foods again, that they will have a very serious So if you, talk, you take reaction. them off, you could actually make them worse. Exactly. So you That's don't want right. to fiddle with their diets. You don't want to fiddle with their diets unless you know what you're doing. Basically. And of course with eczema, you want to treat it properly, don't you? Yes. Jan Jan yes. Take yes. us through the... The, the biggest thing um, with all people with eczema is to actually be using enough moisturiser. And within um, Australia and worldwide, the majority of people do not use enough moisturiser. Um, for example, a, a, an adult or a teenager should be using about 500 grams of moisturiser a week. And that's of a thick moisturiser, um, not in a pump pack, so that when you tip the tub upside down, it doesn't come out and it should be thick. And non perfume like The brand is not important, it's the thickness of the moisturiser. Um, and a child such as um, the little ones, uh, um, a baby about 125 grams and a child about 250 grams a week right. of moisturiser. Right, and an adult, that whole tub a week. An adult would be that whole tub a week, and a, and a teenager. And also have baths rather than showers and soak around in the bath. Um, a a non-soap based wash uh, in the bath. Um, I usually suggest that people get it from the pharmacy um, rather than the supermarket. There's a bit more guidance there on um, the non-soap based things. And no bubbles and no lovely smells of products and not right. that baby smell. And you were saying to me before we came on air that when people do treat properly and moisturise like that, they're less tempted to fiddle with the diet. Uh, yes, it tends to take the focus away from the diet because the skin's improving and it's the moisturiser because basically with eczema, we've got skin like a um, brick wall and people with eczema don't have enough mortar in the um, 
in between the bricks and the person has to be replacing that. We haven't got any drug that will fix that yet. And we put that barrier across the top and that stops the irritants and potentially perhaps allergens that the, the jury is out on that mm. at the moment, but there's increasing research suggesting that that may be a factor um, and this will keep those things on the outside. Cecil is age 45. He's a farmer. He lives about 35 kilometres out of town on a large sheep station. He's come to the practice saying that he might have hay fever. He complains of constant sneezing, coughing, itchy eyes, a runny nose and headaches. And he also feels tired and run down. There's been an increasing problem over a number of years now, getting worse, particularly in springtime. And he's recently noticed a bit of wheezing and uh, tightening in his chest. And he's brought this to you, Rob, to get sorted out. Well, the first thing to, to tease out from his history is whether he gets symptoms all year round as well as a, an exacerbation in the springtime. Uh, seasonal symptoms are almost always pollen related. Uh, perennial all, all year round symptoms almost always dust mite, sometimes mold uh, related. And, uh, but often there's a combination of things. They may be sensitised to several allergens, so maybe both pollen and dust mite. And also worth remembering that dust mites proliferate more in the warm, humid weather. And so there can be a seasonal element to people with dust mite allergy. So he needs to be tested. And normally... Again, spring prick, not patch. No, yes, normally we'd start with uh, skin prick tests with a standard range of pollens and, and dust mites. Um, the particular pollens will vary geographically around the country, so it's important for people to be aware which are the pr predominant pollen allergens in their region and to make sure that those are the ones that are tested for in, in those patients. Once you've made the diagnosis... Um, yeah, I mean, how does it change your management if you find out that you know, there are some form of, you know, buffalo grass is what they're uh, reacting to and you can hardly protect yourself against it? Yeah, pollen, pollen allergy is very difficult to avoid. Uh, it's a, to avoid the pollen exposure, we have to breathe. The pollen's in the air, not much you can do about it. Um, there are measures, you know, people talk about floppy hats and all that sort of thing and staying indoors, but people who live out in the country, you know, it's not, it's not possible. So really... Uh, so how does it change the management, knowing that it's pollen? Well, you, you would probably be more inclined to start immunotherapy in somebody with a pollen allergy. Oh, and that works for rhinitis? It certainly does, yes. Um, not in every case. And is that an, an oral...? It can be done, but uh, orally, but uh, injection immunotherapy is generally the preferred method. It's thought to be slightly more efficacious. Um, and that's done in a, in a similar way over a period of uh, several weeks, gradually building But isn't up a surface reaction in the mucosa? Why wouldn't you treat the mucosa rather than the... Well, of course, you should be treating the mucosa with, uh, with uh, sprays, usually a steroid spray to cut down the inflammation, maybe worth... But the immunotherapy, not. Sorry? But the immunotherapy, not. Because in food allergy, you, you are treating orally not yeah, by injection. That is absolutely true. However, um, the, in, in this case, it, if you can think of it's an allergy to bee venom um, immunotherapy, what you're doing is actually trying to induce the immune system to tolerance, tolerance. to tolerate these, these pollen allergens. So what you're doing is injecting a sm subcutaneously a small amount so of the specific pollen. So yeah. why doesn't immuno immunotherapy work for house dust mite? It does. Well, it does. Oh, does it? Yeah. Yep. All right. I thought it didn't. No, it no, does. No. Um, old, the old preparations that were around 20 or 30 years ago were not as highly purified as the current ones. Uh, and now we have standardised allergens for a whole range of things, including dust mite, bee venom, pollens and so forth. And, them and it's the same deal, treatment. five years of treatment? Three to five years. I mean, a lot of people would stop after three or four years and say, let's see what happens. And there's no benefit from going nuts in the house, ripping up all the carpets, wrapping every mattress in polythene? Well, people have different opinions about that. I have to confess I'm a dust mite Nazi. <laughs> uh, so but I I've really... I've been tested in randomised trials and found to be useless. The, the, pro the problem is it's a package deal. Yeah. When you only test one approach on its own, nothing can be shown to be that effective. But when you do the whole package, 
I think quite often you can uh, get much better control over symptoms. And that package may include pulling up the carpets, uh, putting covers on the bed. It might include much more frequent washing of the sheets. You'd be surprised how many people wash their sheets once every three or four weeks. Okay. It's going to be too much detail here, I think. <laughs> I, I, I think, it, but I, I have, there, there is a lot, you're right, Norman, there's a lot of controversy about the environmental control and a lot of the studies were done in environments such as very high up um, where there is very little dust mite. In Sydney, for instance, you can really not get the level of house dust mite down to a level that's actually possible. There's so in, much in, rain. In, 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 in places, Wagga, there's almost in places none. like Tucson. Well, that, that's 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 true. But you know, we we really a lot of a lot of money is spent on on a lot of um, this house dust mite control measures, which I think is probably not well spent. Um, what we advise actually in young children who have house dust mite contributing to their, um, for instance, we think it might be contributing to their eczema, um, is to say concentrate on the bedding, the bedroom, because that's where the that's where your bang for your buck goes. Um, and there are some really good. So you have a relatively new mattress, and and a, and a new pillow, um, and if you're using a pillow at all, and you can get very good quality um, enclosing covers that enclose the mattress and the pillow and the, the doona and so on. So I, I think that's probably where the effort should be put rather than sort of buying, buying, buying leather, leather furniture and ripping up all your carpets uh, and I, so I don't disagree with that. I yeah. think the bedroom is the place to focus yeah, and the bed true. is the place yeah. in the bedroom where the yeah. mites breed, yeah. where the droppings are. Mm -hmm. And every time you roll over in bed, there's this little microscopic cloud of mud droppings rises in the <laughs> air and you're breathing it in and out <laughs> all night. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't bother those of us who are not allergic, unfortunately. <laughs> this this is the nature of allergy. Yes. That, that's Sorry, what did you say, Darren? Hot washing. washing. You hot have to wash washing, the sheets yeah. and you know, child or person's pyjamas in water that's 55 or 60 degrees. That unglues right. the eggs, basically, from the sheets. Yeah. Right. And there's, and there's a little... There are little issues to worry about, such as damp. A lot of houses have got damp under the floor, yeah. rising damp in the in the walls or in the bathroom. And the uh, so the environment is humid. The the mites proliferate more more rapidly when it's humid. Uh, kid's got eczema. He's got shedding little shedding skin, skin flakes in the bed. The mites feed oh on that. God. So it a, becomes a vicious circle. They don't sleep very well. No, no, no vicious no, no. circle. I'm just itching already. Okay, yeah. <laughs> this has been fascinating. Well, we're going to get on to drug allergies, but I think we've covered them. I, I'm just interested in what your takeaway messages are. Darren? Uh, well, mine largely would be that the nurses out working in general practice and in rural uh, communities uh, are that they utilise and look for the resources that are on the um, ASCIA website, which is the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. Great number of evidence-based resources there for nearly every manifestation of allergic disease. And there are some useful resources here, aren't there, the, which we've got on the screen now? Yes, very useful resources there, Anaphylaxis Australia, uh, etc., and, and then the College of GP. Um, but the ASCIA ones are updated very regularly on good evidence-based resources, and there's also things there that dispel myths and misconceptions. So, uh, and then of course the um, registered nurses that might want to go on and further their qualifications. You got your ad at the beginning, don't you? Yes, the allergy courses. Well. <laughs> so, a combination of both, they'll be uh, the patients will be well ahead. Maria, uh, my take-home message is, I guess that um, there's for most allergies there is no cure. That people need to learn life, need to learn to live life with it. Um, there are more questions than we have answers at present. And with education and support, people can manage and have a great quality of life. Rob? Um, well, I think doctors ought to uh, bear in mind that people can often forget how to use their EpiPen so that, or their Anapen, so that when they come into the surgery and there's someone you know that's at risk of anaphylaxis, first thing to do is say, where's your EpiPen? Why didn't you bring it? Should go with you everywhere. And, and then show them the trainer and say, do you know how it works? Within a couple of years of being shown, they've forgotten. And so they, they might say, yeah, I know. And they say, show me. And often they'll be fiddling and won't know what end is what. So then they need to be re-educated to have a refresher course. If you've got a practice nurse, you can get her to train them and bring them up to date. 
The other thing I think is useful, there are these uh, kits, they're free. Each of the auto-injector companies uh, have an online uh, membership thing where you can register. And uh, I've got DVDs that can be shown to relatives. Great. Thanks, Rob. Alison? Okay, I think what I'd like to emphasise is that with the rapid um, growth in the rate of allergic diseases, particularly food allergy, and particularly in children, that we all have to work together, actually, and help each other to manage this, this um, real no. crisis. Um, you know, we, we cannot possibly manage all these children in the tertiary centres. We have to engage the help of our rural colleagues and we have to educate and we have to learn and we have to help each other Share to do care. this. Yep. And briefly, Kim? I think for dietitians, we have to take our advice from our doctors on what comes out of the diet. Don't try to interpret anything that's up to the diet, the doctors to do that. And once we know then what comes out of the diet, it's very important that the diet for that child then becomes balanced and you're watching their growth all the way through and that it gets I plotted. Any distortions. So again, these same sorts of websites, the ASCIA website, the um, uh, Anaphylaxis Australia website have some fantastic handouts that can be used to teach people to read the, uh, the, ha um, the food labels and what are the tricky things to avoid. So take, make use of them. Thank you all very much indeed. If, you've been, if you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised in the program or like to watch it again, please visit the Rural Health Education website, rhef.com.au, and click on Allergic Disease on the Increase. If you're a health professional, don't forget to complete your CBD evaluation form, which can be completed online. You'll receive a certificate of attendance and, if eligible, points. Our thanks to the Department of Health and Ageing for making this program possible and thanks to you for taking the time to watch our discussion today. We'd appreciate your feedback on the program and your comments are very important to us. Let us know you watch the program by sending us an email, text or tweet and feel free to share your views. We'd love to hear them. I'm Norman Swan and bye for now and join us again soon on the Rural Health Channel.